Morning, BookTube. Bill Rutenberg here with the Rutenberg Library. Uh, wanted to come to you today with a book haul. Um, recently, I've been collecting, uh, well, I've got various books from de various places, uh, kind of just sitting over here by the desk, and I know my wife wants me to clean them up, so I need to show them to you. Um, so I'm going to have, I've got some book hauls, I've got some mail haul, and um, I'm going to show these in a couple different videos because there's quite a few books here. And I uh, just wanted to share them with you. I'm pretty excited to add them to my collection. Um, like I said, I've gotten them from various uh, places and I'll, I'll kind of show them to you in clumps. So uh, one of the last couple book hauls that I had showed you, I had gotten books from our local public library. She had had a, our librarian had had a donation and she had taken books uh, out of the donation to replace books in the stacks at the library, but then she had a whole bunch of others that she was just uh, going to donate and get rid of, and I had went to the library. I guess it was good timing because when I went to the library, she's, hey, you want to go downstairs? You want to check these out before I, you know, get rid of them? And I said, sure, and you are not going to believe what was in that collection. It was absolutely fabulous. Uh, some of the stuff that I found. I didn't I didn't take everything. There was a lot of stuff that's just not not up my alley, but there were quite a few things that I did like. Um, so everybody's familiar with, or most of you are familiar with, the Folio Society, pretty high-end uh, books. And if you know me and my channel, I don't usually collect high-end books because I can't afford them. <laughs> and, um, you know, I went online and saw some of the prices for some of these when they're new and I was just like holy moly I mean it'd be nice to be able to for uh, to be able to get them but I just don't I my collection for the most part is um, all used books for pretty cheap amounts and so um, when I went to the library she had down in the uh, downstairs in that donated collection a whole bunch of folio society books some of them hadn't even been opened yet they were still in the plastic and um, so when I saw those I was like yes ma'am yes ma'am I will take those um, so I wanted to share those that's part of this collection so here's the first batch this is a four set of uh, Plutarch's lives volumes one through four from the folio society I thought that was pretty sweet still half in the plastic. This one actually looks like it had been opened and, and messed with, but um, I wanted to show you, I'll grab volume two here. So you look at those covers, isn't that beautiful? That is absolutely awesome. And uh, you know, you just look at these books and they are just, they're beautiful. They've, they're very reader friendly. They got, you know, wide margins, the fonts, uh, a size that everybody can actually read it. And um, I'm just super excited to add these high quality books to my collection. Now, um, it's got nice little uh, picture drawings in there. Now, I am not uh, familiar with Plutarch's Lives. I've seen, I've seen it on people's channels before, but I have never read them. And um, I don't usually, to be honest, I don't usually read this, the older stuff like this. So, um, I, I mean, I'm probably going to dabble in it and, and just check it out. I, it, it'll stay in the collection just because of how nice the books are. Um, not necessarily something that goes with the rest of my stuff, but it's a nice addition. Um, so let me put this down here out of the way. All right. So another one that was in, in this stack of books was, uh, the devil's dictionary by Ambrose Bierce, uh, also from the folio society. Now this one had been opened and it has been, you know, bookmarked in various places. So this one's been looked at, but that's okay. It's still in really, really good condition. There's your, your, uh, cover. Now I just saw this talked about. I'm not. I wasn't familiar with it. I'm familiar with Bierce, but um, I was not familiar with this particular book. And I think it was Vin's uh, at Revenant Reads. I think he's the one that mentioned it maybe a week ago, two weeks ago. I can't remember, but he had mentioned this book on there, and um, I was like, oh, interesting. And then lo and behold, it popped up in this uh, stack of books. So that was kind of neat. That was that was a neat coincidence. But um, another nice little addition to the bookshelf. Uh, another Folio Society, and I got a whole bunch of them upstairs that I, well, not a whole bunch, 
oh, a couple, three, four more sets that I picked up that are upstairs that I'll show you in a later video. But here's one that's still in the wrapper. This is uh, Rum Pull by John Mortimer. Again, another author I am not familiar with, but I have heard the name John Mortimer mentioned by several people. And uh, so there's that one. I'm going to leave it in the wrapper for now. I'm not going to open it up, but another nice addition to the collection. Um, in that set of books that was in the lib at the library, they also had some DVD sets that were in there. And... Because, excuse me, we just got done with uh, March Mystery Madness. Um, I picked this one up. I've never watched it before. It comes from uh, like A&E from BBC. Uh, Ag Agatha Christie. These are uh, the uh, Marple TV show. And it's the Classic Mysteries Collection. And so um, I was happy to add this and just give it a try. I don't know if I'll like them or not. Uh, I've heard many people talk about them. So... Um, just reading the back here, it says, Return to post-war England for mystery and a cup of tea with Agatha Christie's most popular creation. The consummate, uh, prim, and proper crime-fighting spinster, Miss Jane Marple, sets down her knitting needles to unwind the most ingenious crimes as she travels from city to countryside and even the Bahamas, murders, missing bodies, and haunted dreams have a habit of falling across Miss Marple's path which is precisely when, tail up and head down, the beloved aunt and uh, godmother goes into action. So digitally remastered and faithfully adapted from Agatha Christie's best-selling novels, the classic murders collection features Joan Hickson, uh, Christie's personal choice to play the spinster sleuth, in over 15 hours of suspense, misdirection, rich period detail and the cleverest solutions imaginable so this one <clears throat> excuse me this one uh includes a caribbean mystery the mirror cracked from side to side sleeping murder 450 from paddington the moving finger at bertram's hotel murder at the uh, vicarage nemesis and they do it with mirrors so um I'm going to give that a try, and, and my wife and I like to sit and watch, uh, you know, murder show, murder mysteries, so we're going to give that a try and see if we like it, and if we do, great, it'll stay in the collection. If not, you know, we can always uh, give that away, and I'm sure somebody will appreciate it. Um, so another, uh, these next few, next couple books were also from the, uh, the basement in the library. Uh, this is Journals, 1952 to 2000, Arthur M. Schlesinger Jr., the, you know, the famous historian. So I was pretty excited to get that. That's kind of neat. Not usually up my alley. I don't read a lot of, uh, journals and letters and that kind of stuff, but, uh, I'm familiar with Schlesinger's work. So that was kind of neat to pick that up and maybe, uh, you know, get into his mind and, and, uh, what he was thinking about as he was reading or, or excuse me, writing his books. But, um, read the inside cover to you. It says, For more than half a century, Arthur Schlesinger Jr. was at the vital center of American political and cultural life. From his entrance into political leadership circles in the 1950s through his years in the Kennedy White House and up until his very last days, he was that rare thing, a master historian who enjoyed an extraordinary eyewitness vantage on history as it was being made. On intimate terms with many of the most prominent political, cultural, and intellectual figures of the last 50 years, he was a man whose proximity to power never obscured his appreciation for the reality of those who have, uh, who have none. For that capacity, for empathy, and for much else, he was often called American liberalism's greatest voice. The mo for most of his adult life, Arthur Schlesinger Jr. dutifully recorded his experiences and opinions in journals that until now have never been seen. Edited by his eldest, oldest sons, they offer remarkably fresh and lucid observations on half a century of public life and a rare and privileged view into the mind of one of America's most distinguished men of letters, Frank Relevatory, uh, suffused with wit and humanity, these entries offer an intimate history of post-war America. From his days on Adlai Stevenson's campaign team to his years in JFK and RFK's inner circle, and through 
uh, through to the election of George W. Bush, they contain his candid reminiscence about many of, it, of the signal events of our time. The Bay of Pigs, the devastating assassinations of the 1960s, Vietnam, Watergate, the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, Bush v. Gore. These journals also offer an extraordinary window into the lives of a wide range of politicians, intellectuals, writers, and actors who were his friends. From the Kennedys to the Clintons, from Henry Kissinger to Adlai Stevenson, from Norman Mailer to Lauren Bacall, Together, they form an astonish, astonishingly vivid portrait of American politics and culture in the second half of the 20th century, one that only a man who knew everyone and missed nothing could provide. Arthur Schlesinger Jr. was one of America's greatest moral and intellectual forces, and the publication of his journals in bo is both itself an epic event in the history of American letters and a fitting opportunity to celebrate this most remarkable American life. And so uh, pretty excited to, to get that. I think that's kind of neat. It will give a, you know, a insider's view and stuff and, you know, just give another point of view. So that's pretty neat to pick up. Uh, the last book that I picked up from the library this last round when I went in there was uh, King Kaiser Czar. Three Royal Cousins Who Led the World to War by uh, Katrine Clay. And so I was pretty excited to pick this up. I've been picking up a lot of stuff on the kings and queens across Europe. And of course, these three uh, were all in leadership roles. Uh, you know, King of England, Kaiser in Germany, Tsar of Russia during uh, or at the beginning of World War One and through World War One, and um, just it's it's going to tell that story of the family and uh, all the issues they had going into war. You know, uh, going back to the the English royal family being married into all the other royal families across Europe, it caused definitely an issue heading into World War One. And reading the inside cover, oh, I guess I haven't told you when any of these were published. Sorry about that. Um, this one is a 2006 book from Walker and Company. And um, it says, Known among their families as Georgie, Willie, and Nikki, they were respectively the royal cousins George V of England, Wilhelm II of Germany, and Nicholas II of Russia. The first two grandsons of Queen Victoria, the latter her grandson by marriage, in 1914, on the eve of World War, they controlled the destiny of Europe and the fates of millions of their subjects. The outcome and their personal endings are well known. Nicky shot with his family by the Bolsheviks, Willie in exile in Holland, and Georgie still atop his throne in England. Largely untold, however, is the family saga that played such a pivotal role in bringing the world to the precipice. Drawing widely on previously unpublished royal letters and diaries and made public for the first time by Queen Elizabeth II, Catherine Clay, Katrine Clay, I, I'm not sure how to say her name, uh, chronicles the riveting half century of the royals' overlapping lives and their slow, inexor inexorable march into conflict. They met frequently from childhood on holidays and at uh, weddings, birthday parties, and each other's coronations. They saw themselves as royal colleagues, a trade union of kings, standing shoulder to shoulder against the rise of socialism, republicanism, and revolution. And yet tensions abounded between them. Clay uh, deftly reveals how intimate family details had deep historical significance. The, antipa the antipathy Willie's mother, Victoria's grand... Gra uh, excuse me, Victoria's daughter, felt toward him because of his withered left arm and how it affected him throughout his life. The family tension caused by Otto von Bismarck's annexation of Schleswig and Holstein from Denmark. Georgie and Nikki's mothers were Danish princesses. The sur uh, surreality uh, surrounding the impending conflict. Have I gone mad? Nicholas asked his wife, Alexandra, in July of 1914. Showing her another telegram from Wilhelm, what on earth does Willie mean pretending that it still depends on me whether war is averted or not? Germany had, in fact, declared war on Russia six hours earlier. At every point in her remarkable book, Katrine Clay shred, 
or sheds new light on a watershed period in world history. And so that'll be uh, you know, a nice little addition to some of the books that I've picked up on that time period here recently. Uh, it'll go hand in hand with those. So I'm looking forward to that. I teach that subject a little bit to my uh, kids at school and the kids are always amazed at how all the families were so linked together but yet they were in a world war with each other. I thought that was, it's always you know kind of interesting to show that. So the next book, um, I found at our um, give one, take one little box library that's in the downtown of, of, my, uh, of our town here. And uh, it is Boy Soldier, Coming of Age During World War II by Russell E. Uh, McLogan. And so that looked really interesting from a soldier's point of view, you know, being a young man along with many other young men heading off to war. And what was that like? <coughs> Excuse me. And this comes from, oh, and it's signed. That's pretty cool. Uh, by Terrace Press. And it is a 1998 book, it looks like. 1998. And uh, I'll read the front cover of this one, too, because it, it looks like it'll be pretty interesting. It says, It is said that in order to completely understand a man... You should probe the world as it existed when he was 19 or 20 years old at the moment he became mature and autonomous as a man. Russell McLogan has done just that in this well-written autobiography. Drafted out of college at age 18 in 1944, he was hastily taught to fire a rifle and then sent to the Philippine Islands as an infantry replacement. There he joined the battle-hardened 6th Infantry Division on Shimbu Line near Manila. Wounded in combat in northern Luzon, he spent 89 days in army hospitals on Luzon and Layette. When the atomic bomb abruptly ended the war, he was returned to duty just in time to sail off to Korea, where he served in the Army of Occupation. Boy Soldier is about a young man's coming of age during this period of tremendous historical change. It includes much well-researched history of the Army's replacement training system, the liberation of the Philippines, the dropping of the atomic bombs, the American-Russian occupation of Korea, and the Army's post-war demobilization, the people, places, and events that shaped a young life. Written in a scholarly mode, yet contains the humor, violence, sexual situations, and raw language as it actually happened. Includes end notes, bibliography, and index. And so I thought that sounded pretty interesting when I saw that in the in the free box, and so I picked that up. You know, it's always good to get a, a different perspective on things. A lot of times we get a general's perspective. It's always nice to see, uh, you know, the perspective of a young soldier. So that'll be good for the collection. The next one I picked up the last time I went to the. Um, Dollar Tree, you know, books for a dollar there. Some it's it's hit and miss, but sometimes they have some good nonfiction. They'll go through spurts of where they have you know several nonfiction titles that they can pick up. There's always a lot of fiction. I just don't uh, have a lot of room for fiction, um, but this one is a piece of fiction. Um, it, it looked really interesting. I couldn't I couldn't uh, pass it by. I almost did, and then I was like, nope, gonna get it. So this is Harry Turtle Dove, and if you're familiar with him, he re uh, he writes alternative histories, and so this one is Armistice, the Hot War, and so um, basically alternative history dealing with you know it looks like I haven't I haven't actually dug into this, but it looks like maybe the atomic bomb and some stuff with Korea, and so that'll be really interesting and in how that plays out. Um, takes place in the looks like you know early 1950s, and like I said, I'm guessing the you know atomic age plays a little bit of a role there. Um, also, in the mail, I got my latest edition of the Smithsonian. Uh, I like and enjoy this magazine. Smithsonian always has some interesting stuff. It's got uh, primarily American history, but it's also got some world stuff. It's got not only history, but it's usually got some geography, archaeology. It's got a little bit of everything in it. And so um, I had recently, well, that was a couple months ago, found a subscription for like, like dirt, dirt cheap. And um, was like, yes, yes, I will. I think it may have been, even been like, and I could be wrong, but I think like eight bucks for a year subscription. It was something you just can't pass up. It was really, really cheap. So anyway, um, this next 
bunch of books is from Books Revisited. Uh, my daughter and I went birthday shopping for my wife yesterday. Uh, we had a half day of school because spring break started uh, after school was done at the ha uh, you know, 115 early dismissal, and then we're on spring break for Thursday, Friday, and then Monday of next week. So um, we started our celebration off with uh, going birthday shopping for my wife. Her birthday's next week, and um, I won't tell you her age. I don't want her to hurt me. <laughs> um, but uh, I stopped at Books Revisited while we were in town and picked up a stack of books that looked really, really good, really interesting. They're in really great shape. Um, didn't spend a ton of money and so I'm pretty happy about that and I think I've told you guys before if you're if you're new to the channel books revisited you can get paperbacks for a dollar hardbacks for two dollars and then sometimes every once in a while there's some books that are marked up a little bit if they're you know a valuable book and uh, but you can get all kinds of good stuff they keep the they keep the shelves pretty well cycled through for the most part there's always new titles in there they take them out of the public library uh, when they are um, discarding them, when they're you know cycling through, and they'll put them in there and sell them, and then people donate their personal collections. Matter of fact, um, it wasn't that long ago, there was um, uh, somebody who had passed away, and their kids were t bringing their books to Books Revisited to donate them, and they had in there a set of leather-bound books with the gold on the uh, on the outside of the pages, like super sharp books, leather bound. Uh, they had Will Durant's Civilization series, the entire series, leather bound. They looked pretty sweet for uh, 150 bucks for the entire set. Awesome deal. Uh, they were selling. They had some other, a whole bunch of other ones in there also, and they were selling those for like 20 bucks a piece, which wasn't a bad price. A little out of my. I don't usually spend that much, but when I got there yesterday, they were all gone. <laughs> He's uh, the guy behind the desk said they were going to bring in a bunch more. The lady was going to bring in a bunch more if they sold well, and so and they did. So she's going to bring them in, but. I probably won't spend, I know I'm not going to spend 20 bucks a book, but they looked pretty sweet. They would have been a nice addition. But anyway, I picked these up while we were there. So <clears throat> first book here is The Richest Woman in America, Hetty Green in the Gilded Age by Jeanette Wallach. And it just looked interesting. Uh, of course, you know, um, women typically early on in our history weren't able to accumulate large fortunes that was usually led left to the men and uh, just because of you know how laws were and just the how society was but in this case obviously this lady did um, and I'm not familiar with her so this is going to be a brand new um, brand new information for me and it looked real interesting so I picked it up it is a double day book out of New York and it's a 2012 book. And so let me um, read you the front cover. It says, A captivating biography of America's first female tycoon, Hetty Green, the I iconoclast who forged one of the greatest fortunes of her time. So uh, no woman in the Gilded Age made as much money as Hetty Green. At the time of her death in 1916, she was worth at least $100 million, equal to about $2.5 billion today. You know, and I don't care if you're a man or a woman, that's a lot of money. Uh, pretty impressive. Um, abandoned at birth by her neurotic mother, scorned by her misogynist father, Hetty set out as a child to prove her value. Following the simple rules of her wealthy Quaker father, she successfully invested her money and along the way proved to herself that she, too, was wealthy and therefore worthy. Never losing faith in America's potential, she ignored the herd mentality and took advantage of financial panics and crises. When everyone else was selling, she bought railroads, real estate, and government bonds. And when everyone was buying and uh, borrowing, she put her money into cash and earned safe returns on her dollars. Men mocked her and women scoffed at her frugal ways, but Hetty turned her back on them and piled up her earnings, amassing a fortune that supported businesses, churches, municipalities, and even the city of New York itself. She relished a challenge, 
When her aunt died and didn't leave Hetty the fortune she had been promised, she plunged into groundbreaking lawsuit that still resonates in law schools and courts. When her husband defied her and sank her money into his own risky in interests, she threw him out and marching down to Wall Street quickly made up the losses. Her independence, outspokenness, and disdain for the upper crust earned her a reputation for harshness that endured for decades. Newspapers kept her in the headlines, linking her name with witches and miscreants. Yet those who knew her admired her warmth, her wisdom, and her wit. Set during a period of financial crisis, strikingly similar to our current one, acclaimed author Jeanette Wallach's engrossing exploration of a fascinating life revives a rarely mentioned queen of American finance. So anyway, that sounded like it's going to be an excellent uh, little read. Uh, definitely sounds like a woman who was defying her era. And so I always like to see that. I always think that's neat. These, uh, you know, larger than life uh, uh, individuals that are in their time period. So that's going to be good. Um, the next book, this is one that I paid a little bit more. I paid a $3 instead of 2 but uh, it looks excellent, and it is in awesome condition. This is Gandhi Before India by uh, Rob, and then forgive me, I, I'm going to struggle with this uh, name, Ramachandra uh, Guha. Sorry for butchering it. I know I probably did. Uh, but anyway, I paid 3 bucks for this one. But it is in absolutely great condition. It is brand new. Uh, it was in the library, but it doesn't look like it got checked out. It's, by, it's from Alfred Knopf out of New York, 2014. So obviously a biography of Gandhi before he hit it big. Um, so it says, here's the first volume of a magisterial uh, biography of Mohandas Gandhi that gives us the most illuminating portrait we have had of the life, the work, the historical context of one of the most abidingly influential and controversial men in modern history. Ramachandra Guha, hailed by time as the Indian democracy's preeminent chronicler, takes us from Gandhi's birth in 1869 through his upbringing to Gujarat, uh, his two years as a student in London and his two decades as a lawyer and community organizer in South Africa. Gua has uncovered a myriad previously untapped documents, including private papers of Gandhi's contemporaries and co-workers, contemporary newspapers and court documents, the writings of Gandhi's children, the secret files kept by the British M Empire functionaries, using his, this wealth of material in an exuberant, brilliantly nuanced, and detailed narrative, Gua describes the social, political, and personal worlds inside of which Gandhi began the journey that would earn him the honorific Mahatma, great soul. And more clearly than ever before, he elucidates how Gandhi's work in South Africa, far from being a mere prelude to his accomplishments in India, was profoundly influential in his evolution as a family man, political thinker, social reformer, and ultimately beloved leader. In 1893, when Gandhi set sail for South Africa, he was a 23-year-old lawyer who had failed to establish himself in India. In this remarkable biography, the author makes clear the fundamental ways in which Gandhi's ideas were shaped before his return to India. In 1915, it was during the, his years in England and South Africa, Gua shows that Gandhi came to understand the nature of imperialism and racism, and in South Africa that he forged the philosophy and techniques that would undermine and eventually overthrow the British Raj. Gandhi, before India, uh, gives us equally vivid portraits of the man and the world he lived in, a world of sharp contrasts among the coastal culture of his birthplace, high Victorian London and colonial South Africa. It explores in abundance, in abundant detail, Gandhi's experiments with dissident cults such as the Tolstoyans, the Friends with Radical Jews, uh, heterodox Christians, and devout Muslims. His inimitable enmities and rivalries and his often overlooked failures as a husband and father. It tells the dramatic and profoundly moving 
uh, story of how Gandhi inspired the devotion of thousands of followers in South Africa. And as he uh, mobilized a cross-class inter-religious coalition pledged to nonviolence in their battle against brutality, brutally racist regime, researched in unequal depth and breadth, and written with extraordinary grace and clarity, Gandhi before India is on every level fully commensurate with its subject. It will radically alter our understanding and appreciation of the 20th century's India's greatest man. So I'm looking forward to that. I teach about him in my uh, seventh grade class. Matter of fact, I'll be doing that in the next few weeks as we look at South and Southeast Asia in, in our geography stuff. But uh, looking forward to reading that. They actually had another biography on Gandhi that I really wanted, uh, but I chose to leave it because this one looked like um, I'm, I'm very, very much a novice when it comes to his early life. And um, I thought I had probably more to learn on this one than the other one. And so, and plus it was just in just excellent, excellent condition. It's brand new condition. So I was pretty excited about that. Uh, next book in the stack, not necessarily a historical um, great, but kind of fun to read. And it's usually a quick read. I've read uh, most, I think I've actually read all of them by Brian Kilmeade, but it's Sam Houston and the Alamo Avengers, the Texas victory that changed American history. And this is one of the newer ones. I have not read this one, but I've read most of the others and I've enjoyed them. They're, sh they're short histories, uh, meant more for the, um, just the average person in public. It's not necessarily a historical masterpiece, but they, uh, they are good to bring in novice people into the realm of history. Uh, but this is from Sentinel and it is a 2019 book. And so I'm looking, looking forward to reading that. It'll be, like I said, a real quick read. I've read, uh, the Pirates of Tripoli, George Washington's Secret Six, Andrew Jackson, uh, in the Battle of New Orleans. I've read several of them. I've enjoyed them. They're fun little reads. This next one uh, I was real excited about. Uh, it just sounds very, very interesting. It is uh, Tomlinson Hill by Chris Tomlinson, uh, the remarkable story of two families who share the Tomlinson name, one white, one black. And so... Um, it is, you know, story of our of our country's history and in how, um, you, you know, white and African American people have lived side by side for most of this history and or pretty much all the history and um, how these the the peoples have grown together and so listen to this description of the book. It sounds like it's going to be an awesome read. Um, it says, internationally recognized for his work as a fearless war correspondent, award-winning journalist Chris Tomlinson grew up hearing stories about his family's abandoned cotton plantation in Falls County, Texas. Most of the tales lionized his white ancestors for pioneering along the Brazos uh, River. His grandfather often said the family slaves loved them so much that they also took the Tomlinson as, as their last name. Ladanian Tomlinson, football great and former running back for the San Diego Chargers, spent part of his childhood playing on the same land that his black ancestors had worked as slaves. As a child, Ladanian uh, li believed the hill was named after his family. Not until he was old enough to read an historical plaque did he realize that the hill was named for his ancestor slaveholders. A masterpiece of authentic American history, Tomlinson Hill traces the true and very revealing story of these two families. From the beginning in 1854, when the first Tomlinson, a white woman, arrived in two, to 2007, when the last Tomlinson, Ladanian's father, left, the book unflinchingly explores the history of race and bigotry in Texas. Along the way, it also manages to disclose a great many untruths that are latent in the unsettling and complex story of America. Tomlinson Hill is also the basis for a film with an inner interactive web project. The award-winning film, which airs on PBS, concentrates on present-day Marlin, Texas, and how the community struggles with poverty and the legacy of race today, and is accompanied by an interactive website called Voice of Marlin, which stores the oral histories collected along the way. Chris Tomlinson has used the reporting skills he honed as a highly respected re uh, reporter covering ethnic violence in Africa and in the Middle East 
uh, to fashion a perfect micro microcosm of America's own ethnic strife. The economic inequality, political shenanigans, cruelty, and racism, both subtle and overt, that inform the history of Tomlinson Hill also live on in many ways to this very day in our country as a whole. The author has used his impressive credentials and honest humanity to create a classic work in American history that will take its place alongside the timeless work of our finest historians. So I am really looking forward to that. I think that's going to be a really good glimpse into, uh, you know, definitely two perspectives on American history. Next one. Uh, that I got yesterday is Wooden, A Coach's Life by Seth Davis. Uh, I've been wanting to buy this book for quite a while now. I've been looking at it every time I go in there. This is one that did not uh, necessarily cycle out. I don't know why because it is in like brand new, brand new condition. I'm very excited about this. It's about one of basketball's greatest coaches of all time, John Wooden. Um, it's from Times Books, Henry Holton Company, out of New York, and it is a 2014 book. Um, but, you know, I'm a basketball coach. Uh, I typically read baseball biographies, but I'm going to dip into basketball this time. Um, this, is, this is why. Let me read this to you here. So it's a provocative and re revelatory new biography of the legendary UCLA coach John Wooden by one of America's top college basketball writers. No college basketball coach has ever dominated the sport like John Wooden. His UCLA teams reached unprecedented heights in the 1960s and 1970s, capped by a run of 10 NCAA championships in 12 seasons in an 88-game winning streak, records that stand to this day. Wooden also became a renowned motivational speaker and author uh, revered for his pyramid of success. And if you ever get a chance to listen to some of that, um, you know, go on YouTube and look that up. It is very, very interesting listening to some of his motivational stuff. Uh, Seth Davis of Sports Illustrated and CBS Sports has written the definitive biography of John Wooden, an unflinching portrait that draws on archival research and more than 200 interviews with players, opponents, coaches, and Wooden himself. Davis shows how hard Wooden strove for success from his All-American playing days at Purdue through his early years as a high school and college coach to the glory days at UCLA, only to discover that reaching new heights brought new burdens and frustrations. Davis also reveals how at the pinnacle of his career, Wooden found himself in a, on questionable ground with alumni, referees, assistants, and even some of his players. His was a life not only of lessons taught, but also of lessons learned. Wo woven into the story as well as are the players who powered Wooden's championship teams, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Bill Walton, Walt Hazard, Gail Goodrich, Sidney Wicks, and others, many of whom speak frankly about their coach. The portrait that emerges from Davis's remarkable biography is of a man in full whose life story still resonates today. Um, like I said, I look... Look forward to reading that. That is going to be a good one. Uh, I think there's probably going to be stuff for me to pick up there, you know, as a coach to learn from him. Uh, the next one is uh, A Lifelong Passion, Nicholas and Alexandra, Their Own Story by uh, Andrea Mayalunas and Sergei uh, Mironenko. Apologize for butchering those names. Uh, this is kind of a little bit bigger book. But real excited about this. Again, goes right into history of European monarchs here. Um, all about the Tsar and his wife and the letters that passed back and forth uh, between the two. Uh, I probably won't look uh, read the inside cover because I think it's pretty self-explanatory. But it's about their, um, you know, just about their lives together. And it also has some stuff about the family, like what the, the previous book I showed uh, was talking about. This is from Doubleday, New York. And it is 1997. And so this will be real interesting. I don't have, I keep saying I don't have a lot of books with on just letters from people, but that collection is starting to build up. I'm, I'm going to have to stop saying that eventually. But uh, anyway, look forward to that. That's going to be a good one. Uh, here's an older one that I picked up. It is don't have a dust jacket for it, but uh, Origins of the American Revolution by John C. Miller. And I have some other other books by John C. Miller. 
and I took a chance on this one because I couldn't remember if I had it. Uh, so we'll see. But inside the, the end pages are pretty cool. Got some maps. I always like that. You guys that follow the channel know I'm a fan of the maps. Back one's the same as the front, so I won't show you that one. But uh, this is, it's a little bit older book, but it's in pretty good condition considering the age. It is uh, from Little Brown and Company out of Boston, 1943. Um, so I am really looking forward to this. I think it's going to be good. John C. Miller is pretty well renowned as a historian. And so, um, yeah, that'll be a good one. And this is the last one in the uh, collection here that I picked up. It's the most expensive also. Basically because um, when I was talking with the guy at Books Revisited, he marked it up a little bit more than he usually does because when he looked online at the value of them, uh, there just weren't a lot of them out there and they were for pretty high dollar. And so I, I felt lucky to see this. I, he had actually posted it on the Facebook page that he'd had it in and I was kind of hoping it would be there and it was. So uh, this is War on the Run, the epic story of Robert Rogers and the conquest of America's first frontier by John F. Ross. And so I have nothing in my collection, in my revolution collection, in colonial collection that, that uh, covers this. So I spent six bucks on this, which is not an astronomical amount. I know that. But when you consider I usually only spend one, two, three bucks on a book, um, for me, that was a little bit more. Um, so let me read the back cover to you. Often hailed as the god godfather of today's elite special forces, Robert Rogers trained and led an unorthodox unit of green provincials, raw woodsmen, farmers, and Indian scouts on impossible missions in colonial America that are still the stuff of soldiers' legend. The child of marginalized Scots-Irish immigrants, Rogers learned to survive in New England's dark and deadly forests, grasping, as did few others, that a new world required new forms of warfare. John F. Ross not only recreates Rogers' life and his spectacular battles with breathtaking immediacy and meticulous accuracy, but brings a new and provocative perspective on Rogers' unique vision of a unified continent, one that would influence Thomas Jefferson and ins uh, inspire the Lewis and Clark expedition. Rogers' principles of unconventional war making would lay the groundwork for the colonial strategy later used in the War of Independence and proved so compelling that army rangers will study them today. Robert Rogers, a backwoods founding father, was heroic, admirable, brutal, canny, ambitious, duplicious, du duplicious, uh, visionary, and much more like America itself. And so this is a... Um, Let's see here. This is from Bantam Books out of New York, and it is a 2009 book. So I was really happy to add that to my Colonial Revolution collection. I think that's going to be a real good addition. Very interesting. So anyway, BookTube, uh, sorry the video's so long. Um, I just had a lot to show you. I wanted to share those with you. And I've got um, two boxes sent from Todd at his bursting bookcase that he sent me in the mail that I want to share with you. Um, I'll probably split those into maybe three videos just so they aren't quite so long. But anyway, if you've stuck with me this long, I really, really appreciate it. And I thank you for watching. And I hope some of these titles sound interesting to you. You know, interesting enough, you'll go look those up and put them on your TBR because uh, I know they're now on my TBR. Uh, so until next time, BookTube, again, thank you for watching. I hope everyone has a great, great, blessed holiday uh, weekend. Uh, I know it's only Thursday, but for me, I'm on vacation. So um, anyway, thank you. Thank you for watching and happy reading.